conversation with observers. It is a pleasure uh, to moderate today's uh, conversation uh, hosted by the Executive Director of the UN Environment Program, Mr. Samuel Anderson, Ambassador uh, Liz Valdez Valdivieso, the IEC Chair, and the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, Ms. Jordi Marshall Williams. Just a reminder to everyone, this session uh, is recorded and will be available in the IEC webpage. This marks the third time that we are convening this dialogue, which in a way is part of an ongoing conversation that we hope to continue with you, our observers, throughout the entire process of the IEC. And as always, this meeting is an opportunity for you to provide your feedback as observers, share any concerns you might have, and give us an opportunity to address them directly. As uh, we have scheduled an hour for this meeting, and as always, I'm grateful to uh, the panelists today, and we will read a few brief opening remarks from each of them, and I will open the floor to you, to the observers, for your comments and questions. So I would like to first start with Ms. Anderson. You are first. have an exchange uh, between and amongst us, and obviously thanks to the chair and to the ESP, but most of all thanks to you. Um, your presence has throughout this a press for vision, press for inclusion, press for justice, a press for transparency, press for clarity, and all of that is uh, very important and something that I'd like to just thank you very much. I should also say that um, uh, we've seen uh, significant increase in representation this week around, uh, and this is only Sunday, and clearly the many people will be arriving uh, later on. Um, we have a total of 2,800 individuals from 760 or so organizations registered. You represent a big bulk of that, and I think there's no doubt that you will have been to making, finding a way to get here, to cancel what you otherwise would have done in your life. On this important momentous uh, process uh, makes a big difference for the show. Thank you. I think uh, those of you who have been joining with me over these years know that um, from the UNEP side, uh, we very much consider that observer engagement, um, especially now that we're getting towards, you know, closer to the goal line here, and let us get to that goal line, the UN government really does underline uh, once again. Um, uh, that an inclusive process uh, has to be part and parcel of, of the narrative and of, of the true process, and that your voice uh, will be critical of helping us land on that ambitious, on that just, and on that inclusive global plastics agreement. I think uh, I should recognize that we are, uh, you represent a very rich diversity in, in backgrounds, in sectors, in of representation that has brought you here, but it's that wealth of diversity that actually you know, really brings value uh, because you come with insights into the process. And um, whilst not every voice will be able to be heard during the proceedings, it's critical and I know that the chair and the guests are very keen to ensure that voices are heard through all. We're working with you now, <laughs> and we uh, have never closed our doors. Um, to observers, and we have always tried to ensure that our uh, voices are heard. After all, the UNEP was born out of an activist process uh, back in the 60s and 70s on environmentalism, and so that is our duty, and we need to protect that. So, <clears throat> on the topic at hand, clearly, um, we all understand that your presence here uh, underlines the fact that. And in plastic pollution is not something that can be done by governments alone, let alone by industry alone. It will take a lot of society um, engagement, and that certainly includes all stakeholders. And that engagement that we have seen from civil society, from the from the sector of science and scientists. Uh, from the sector of indigenous peoples, from the waste pickers, and yes, from industry uh, and municipalities and local government, I mean, all of the above, 
and from the finance sector. All of these is what it will take to land us in the gold line. And I want to recognize that tireless work that you have put in. There's a, a little demonstration that passed by. It was too modest, but maybe it will grow. Um, but at any rate, um, it's good that people of Ottawa are also recognizing that this is an issue that is not just global, it's also very local, because each of, one of us, after all, live in a local setting, and what we do in that setting and how we interact with it and the decisions that are taken is critical. Now, um, it was, it, took a, it takes a movement to create a new treaty, convention, agreement, instrument, whatever this baby is going to be named. This is still to be decided, but it takes a movement. And that movement has, in UNEP context, gone on for nearly a decade with our campaigns to end plastic pollution, with our work on quote unquote, ocean plastic, even though there's no such thing in the ocean. I mean, that doesn't make sense to put these two words next to one another. With our campaign um, and, and work in this field. And I think it's fair to say that throughout this work, work for the past decade, had it not been for activists, had it not been for scientists, had it not been for indigenous people, had it not been for women's movement it's, and, and race pickers and on and on and on, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so lifting this across the line at UNEA 5.2 back in the February or so of 2022, I want to pay tribute to many of you who worked very hard to get us across that line. Now we need you to, to, to get us across the next line, which is, of course, um, the, the treaty text itself. And this INC4 is a meeting where we need to just please keep the eyes on the prize. And the prize is a text. The prize is a text that is ambitious, time-bound, with clear goals, etc. That text is before you now, prepared. It includes and references all of the comments that have come in from all 193 and the governments. Have no fear. That's how it works. You know, there is a slim text that is first out and then everybody will comment on and these comments will be reflected and that is why the text has ballooned. But that's the way we negotiate in the UN. And so keep our eyes on this prize. Let us not get distracted by other aspects that could come up, procedural or otherwise. Please help the delegations focus on this because we want to try during this time to get as much of the text reviewed and as much of clarity identified. Where is it that we find broad, broad strokes agreement that we can say, yeah, this is an area that actually we can see it's coming together so that we can identify the areas where we do not have broad strokes agreement. But the more we can obviously deal with and eliminate the areas that are broad strokes agreement, the further we can make it in this rather complex and detailed and difficult to read text. I hope that we can leave Ottawa with a text that is as close as possible to the final agreement, that agreement that you all and we all want to see. And with your good help and your strong support, I have every faith that we can make it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson. Let me now give the floor to Ambassador Vallas Valdivieso for a brief welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Juan Pablo. Uh, Ms. Inger Anderson, Executive Director of UNEP. Ms. Jyoti Matur Philip, Executive Secretary. And dear friends, dear observers, so nice to see you here. I feel quite comfortable to be with you here in this, in this meeting. Uh, I can see also new faces. As the executive director mentioned, it has grown the participation. It has gone, grown your participation. I congratulate you for that engagement, that commitment that you have had. Thank you so much for the work you have done. Thank you so much for the work you are doing. And thank you so much for the work that you will do. 20 years ago, we receive a scientific document telling us about plastic pollution. It was 20 years ago, actually, that we saw that first scientific document. 
and you start talking about that. You start talking about plastic pollution and environment, plastic pollution and human health, and it took some time until member states, countries, we start negotiating. It took 18 years, actually, because we started two years ago with the UNEA resolution. And thank you so much for that engagement. Thank you so much for what you have done, as I mentioned, and for us, also member states, and me as a chair. It's important your participation later on in the process, yes, here in negotiation, but also in the implementation of this treaty. Once again, I'm so happy to, to be here with you. I'm so happy to engage with you. Doors from me as a chair and from my team, always open to talk and ready to answer any questions, ready to hear any comments, as also Juan Pablo mentioned, ready to uh, uh, hear also your concerns. Thank you very much again for all your commitment and let's work together. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Next, let me give the floor to our Executive Secretary, Ms. Matu Philip. Thank you so much, Juan. And good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. It's my pleasure to host this with Ms. Anderson and our chair, um, <clears throat> Luis, uh, Mr. Luis, Ambassador Luis Baez. I have promised him, oh, sorry. I have promised him I will not try to name, to try and pronounce his last name because I, I massacred. So, Ambassador Luis, um, it is a pleasure to uh, host this with you. Uh, dear friends, it is again a pleasure to welcome you here to Ottawa. I'm so glad that you have come, and many more as both the chair and uh, the executive director have said. It is good for us. It is good for us to hear you, to see you, and to, um, and to have this conversation with you. So I don't want to take too much away from your question and answers, and they have said everything. So I will hand back to um, Juan. And again, uh, I am extremely grateful that you are part of this process and that you are um, you, you are dedicating to this uh, your time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mather Philip. And now we will open the floor for some comments or questions that you may have. So um, please uh, raise your hand if you would wish to speak. Um, and when you're given the floor, we ask you to please state your name and organization. In the back of the of the room, there are um, there are no microphones av available. However, a colleague from the secretariat it's, uh, could go to you to uh, pass on the mic. So, if we can get a few uh, show of hands on this side, okay. Okay. So, if we can start from this side, uh, the lady in red, and then uh, next person. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we made it to fourth, to the fourth meeting, so thank you so much for all the efforts that you've done. I'm going to be brief. I am happy to speak on behalf of Healthcare Without Harm. We are a global organization. Uh, you have heard us before in the past three meetings. I'm just happy to say that today we're bringing to you a letter from millions of health professionals, over a thousand individuals and NGOs representing and groups, organizations, health organizations representing millions of doctors and nurses and pharmacists who are bringing to you the words from their sector and their daily practice to make sure that there is no blanket exemption for the healthcare products that are used, especially single use. I want to give the floor to my colleague, who's actually a doctor coming from the Philippines, to give you the why. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Michelle Reyes, a registered pharmacist and medical doctor by training and currently a sustainability officer from Healthcare Without Harm Southeast Asia. I am pleased to share our calls to action, such as developing an ambitious and just treaty to end plastic pollution, including in the health sector. 
Communities, health workers, and health system are already facing the alarming and devastating impacts of plastic production and pollution. In addition, the impacts are not only equally distributed, but instead are concentrated in the most vulnerable and under-resourced communities, such as women, youth, and children. The treaty should uphold the universal right to clean, healthy, and sustainable environment and address human rights impacts of each stage of plastic production and waste management. As a medical doctor, I took the oath to do no harm. Hence, I am here with you with these calls to action. So please help me to uphold this oath by having a treaty that protects the environment and our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to the next person on this side who had their hand up. Thank you. Juliana Cortez on behalf of the Latin American Alliance of Food and Beverage Industry Associations. We appreciate Canada for hosting us in these four bono negotiations and the Secretariat for its available efforts. In this opportunity, regarding the new draft instrument, we would like to focus on alternatives to plastic and the utilization of recycled resin. As we mentioned, plastic is a highly versatile material that plays a critical role in our industry, ensuring food safety and minimizing waste during distribution, marketing, and consumption. While our industry explores new technologies and sustainable materials that consider social, economic, and environmental factors, it's crucial to establish robust scientific processes to evaluate the sustainability and safety of these alternatives, including food safety. Additionally, it's essential to consider what would happen in the event of a sudden global demand for this plastic alternative from various industries. Based on this consideration, beyond a transition from one material to another, it's important to strengthen waste management practices. The main challenge lies in how to better use the materials that are already in use. A strengthened waste management infrastructure and promoting policies for public education would be crucial. Regarding food packaging and material in contact with food, we reiterate our recognition of the Codex Alimentarius as the primary authority for assessing the safety of food contact packaging materials. The Codex Alimentarius is an international body established by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization to develop standard codes of practice, guidelines, and recommendations on food safety. Currently, the Codex is undertaking new work on guidance relating to food safety concerning the use of recycled material in food packaging. This technology will be essential for fulfilling the obligations proposed in the instrument. As we move forward, we would like to know how the food and beverage industry can support this effort to involve the Codex Alimentarius, given its role in analyzing and evaluating the safety of alternative materials to plastic in contact with food and the use and recycled resin. We are confident in the delegations and wish them success in their negotiations and meeting. We will continue to closely follow, follow the progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As we would like to have as many observers as possible to participate, if we could please um, uh, shorten your interventions. And uh, if we are happy to uh, receive any questions or comments that you would want directed to the panelists here with me. So can I see a show of hands once again? Okay, so I'll see a person on the, in the back, and then we go to the front, and then we go to the third person on this side. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Madam Executive Director, and Madam uh, Executive Secretary for this opportunity. I speak as representative of Upholding Life and Nature, a Philippine NGO um, working on environmental, indigenous, and disability sectors. I would like to call your attention on the lack of limited or even non-existent participation of persons with disabilities in the current dis discussion. PWDs are heavily affected by what we are discussing right now. Based on our very limited consultations with them, we learned that they are heavy users of single-use plastics. Some with mobility or, uh, and, intellectual, uh, and uh, mental problems have difficulty drinking and need to use straws which were immediately banned by some local governments in the Philippines. Many use diapers and need plastics to dispose of them hygienically. It's also likely, as what experts are already saying, that they will result in, that nanoplastics and microplastics will result in more disabilities or make the existing ones suffer uh, even more. The ones we consulted were also very clear 
that they are one with us in aspiring for more ambitious targets in plastics reduction, except that they want that, that they should not be unnecessarily and unjustifiably burdened. We need a just transition that's also inclusive. I therefore ask and urge the Chair, the Secretariat, and delegates to please keep this ver very vulnerable sector in mind, and we offer two suggestions. One is by explicitly naming them as a sector of concern in the proposed instrument, particularly in just transition and stakeholder engagement. Secondly, I'd like to ask the, chair, the, ex the, the Secretariat if there are consultative mechanisms for this sector to be immediately instituted. As their maxim goes, nothing about us without us. For us, this translates to better late than never. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam, and my colleagues for your kind attention. Hi, I, namaste from India. I represent India, a country of, from Asia that accounts for 60% of the uh, population Asia accounts for. I'm here on behalf of the Indian Plastic Institute and Plastic India Foundation. See, we know we are, we are plastic people, but working for the non-governmental sector, polymers of concern. We come here with a positive view, balanced views, and we only seek the intervention at the INC4 for affordable technologies. We have to work for solution to plastic pollution. All stakeholders are important, but plastic is such one thing that the last plastic was invented in 1976. It's a young material and we just cannot wish it away. We have to find a solution to plastic pollution. The role of startups is also important. Young startups from all over the world, there are, start, there are side events happening. They are here showcasing what they can do. And my only requ humble request again is a balanced view, a view for the common good and a view for Asia also, for we are young and we are growing and their plastics production may not be easy to cut down. <coughs> Balanced view. Thank you. Thank you for Thank the you. floor. Thank um, you very much. Mr. Chair, Madam Executive Director, Madam uh, Executive Secretary, uh, I'm Carlos Sivafil, I'm the President of the International Solid Waste Association, and I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, to highlight some aspects that we should take into consideration during the upcoming days. Because uh, recently, on uh, latest February, uh, together with uh, UNEP, ISVA launched the Global Waste Management Outlook 2024. It's the first uh, INC meeting that we have this uh, emblematic and strategic publication with the most updated data on the situation of the waste management in the world and the way forward. So uh, for those who uh, had a chance to read the publication, you could see that waste generation is growing at a fast pace and plastics are one of the most uh, visible part of it. Uh, we still lack on access of, uh, for waste collection for everybody in the world. A significant part of the waste still goes to inadequate uh, uh, sites or it's openly burned and uh, it's urgent to adopt the waste hierarchy and uh, a transition to a circular economy. Just to highlight one uh, 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 very important data the publication uh, brought is that uh, currently the cost, the global cost of uh, waste management in the world reaches $360 billion per year. If it's left unaddressed like it is today, if we follow the current trend, it will reach $640 billion by 2050. But if we change towards a more circular approach, uh, we will revert this trend and instead of having a cost, we will have a net gain of $108 billion per year. So it's crucial to adopt this change. It's crucial to uh, really move towards a more uh, circular and zero waste approach. But despite all the awareness, despite uh, uh, everything we know, we know we have data, we have science, we are still lacking of action. So really, uh, 
all countries can take steps towards ensuring goods and services are provided in a more sustainable way, and an instrument to address plastic pollution is key to change the current trend and instrumental to support a paradigm shift. This uh, next Wednesday, uh, ISVA will organize a side event in the morning to discuss how waste and resources management can adopt upstream approach to beat plastic pollution and end waste pollution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I can, if I can see, please, a uh, show of hands once again. Okay. We'll see. Um, all the way over there, I see two hands. You have the floor, and then in the back of the room, if a microphone could also go to that side, please. Thank you for the floor. Um, I'll be very brief. First of all, um, I'm Zuhair Ahmed Koshik from Bangladesh, and I represent Global Youth Coalition on Plastic Pollution. Um, from the youth side, we actually um, see this treaty not, not as an inter intergovernmental treaty, rather we see this as an intergenerational pact because the generation who are negotiating this, this is going to impact others' life. Even we, the current generation, young people, we are not negotiating, but we will bear this responsibility because when we'll be in your chair, the, the, the future generation will ask us what we have done for this treaty and how we ensure intergenerational equity has been reflected in the negotiation or discussion. We are concerned about the fact that the intergenerational equity is, must, is, is not much um, considered in the negotiation, but some of the countries actually proposed it as one of the principles. We request more and more consideration of intergenerational equity and youth engagement for the treaty, because being the 60% of the global population, you need us to implement this treaty. You need us for awareness raising. You need us to make businesses responsible. You need us for further bringing more ideas for the implementation. Secondly, um, um, we strongly believe that the ambition we bring in to the multilateral processes, United Nations, different processes, not just UNEP, and also the governments are yet to match that level of ambition. I think you really need to work on further raising ambition and further you know, finding ways best engage with the young people. What we find in many cases, the you know, difficulty in engaging the UN process just because of the differences of mind and ideas, because we are we bring different perspectives that, that you already have. Secondly, uh, when we talk about participation of youth, we participation of women, indigenous people, many other communities, um, in the multilateral, this kind of process, it depends on the accreditation process, depends on the admission of the observers. And um, it's obviously not something that the INC Secretariat can do, maybe UNEP can do in future, that the current accreditation process is very much favorable for the business organization, but not for the youth, women, and indigenous who has limited resources and have limited legal status in their own countries. In different countries, it's very difficult for this kind of stakeholder to get their organizations accredited. And when, it, when I say that, it also brings the conflict of interest um, in the participation. Uh, because we have found an over-representation of the business, uh, not the business, because we obviously want the business organizations, private sector to be represented, but we want only those who, who match the ambition of UNEP, who really contribute towards, towards what UNEP is doing. So yeah, that's one thing that I need to highlight. We need to work on this. We need to seriously work on this. Other than that, uh, we will not be able to reach to the level the ambition that was said by UNIA 5 by 14. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I could go on the uh, uh, front, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fraser. I'm speaking on behalf of Women uh, Working Group on towards ending plastic pollution. Can you get closer to the mic, please? Oh, okay. Okay. How is it now? All right. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of Women Working Group uh, towards ending plastic pollution. I just have a, a short question. Uh, it is about the issue that has been raised uh, many times. Uh, it is well known that major groups and stakeholders are uh, contributing to different unit processes, but they were uh, recognized as major groups uh, in the other processes. So for the INC, uh, it's different. And we just would like to know if this has been taken into consideration to categorize or somehow to uh, recognize the contribution of major groups as major groups instead of, you know, uh, 
you know, like including uh, their contributions or their, their efforts into others. We, we understand there, there are concerns, but uh, what, is, what is like on the way forward towards the engagement of the major groups? Thank you. Thank you very much. I see a hand all the way in the back. If we can give the mic, please, to her. You, if you could please stand and state your name and organization, please. Thank you. I'm Fiona Brown, focal point of the science policy interface for the major group for children and youth of the United Nations. Technology and innovation are essential elements of progress towards reducing plastic pollution and consumption and will be key to finding resilient, sustainable solutions to plastic to the plastic pollution crisis. I urge the Secretariat to include greater emphasis on youth engagement and innovative technology in the negotiation, in the negotiation during the INC session. Thank you for the floor. Thank you very much. If I could go on this side, uh, the lady, please, from Greg. My name is Adeto Mustafa from Nigeria. I'm representing the International Science Council. And uh, our, our expectation for the INC4 is to be clear about just transition, especially for the low and medium income country. Not a just transition in paper, but actually during implementation. And I give an example of where I come from in Nigeria. Oftentimes, when people talk about moving a global event, everyone signing into it, they often feel they will give grants to countries that cannot afford to implement it. But after the grant for one or two years or three years goes, then countries are forced to borrow money, and then generations on bond continue to pay from that. In terms of plastics, Please, let's invest in alternative. Let science be part of the solution. We spend so much time defining the problem, agreeing there is a problem. But like Anga said somewhere, having a recipe for a, a, a soup is not the same as having the soup, preparing the soup. The global plastic treaty is fine, but let's go beyond that and look at the implementation. What are the alternatives? It is not just enough for countries to be banning plastic, essential, uh, non-essential use of plastic, but let's invest time, energy, and include science in the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to uh, go back to our panel for those who would want to respond to some of the comments or questions uh, from observers. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure we'll share it between us, so I won't go through them all. But on the healthcare, let me start at the top. That was from the, the lady in red, who is now speaking to someone. So I'll ask the lady to listen to me because I'm... No, she's not listening. So, oh, okay, she is. Okay. So um, thank you for, for raising this, and thank you for the commitment uh, from uh, healthcare professionals and from the the organization uh, Healthcare Without Harm, which we know, of course, quite well. Um, now, obviously, uh, UNEP does not present, pretend to be a healthcare organization. We have another organization called WHO that deals with that. And uh, as um, my dear colleague, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, uh, regularly says that there is, in the dialogue that they have started at the WHO, a significant conversation precisely around plastic and healthcare. Now, it very well, uh, the, I think the prevailing view is that there will be a need for healthcare and plastic. We heard that also from the gentleman over there who was speaking about uh, people with certain disabilities where there's a requirement for some of these. But there's also a sense that, this can, that there is an overuse and that much can be reduced. And so I think that's one dimension that um, 
I will leave to my colleague Tedros uh, because he is more competent and the WHO is more competent and this is not uh, an area that we have uh, the competence in. However, having said that, I think it's well understood that considerable produ production, uh, reduction can be envisaged. Um, maybe just there were a number of voices from youth to say yes, this is critical and you're, I mean, the good thing about youth is one day you will no longer be young. And so ensuring and holding that space, right, that the, the youth constant, the youth is a constant, your presence may not be a constant because you will move on, but the youth needs to be constant in this conversation as we move into what will become a convention and COP 1, 2, and 3, and 4 at that point, you may well sit and no longer be considered and classified young, but ensuring that youth voice is with UNEP is for us absolutely critical. And again, I go back to our genesis. We were born out of movements that in part reflects youth wanting to fight for the environment. And so this is important. Um, so, and that also goes to the young lady who spoke about the science policy interface, um, a very, very critical point. Um, and finally, just my reflection on the kind lady from the International Science Council from Nigeria. You know, um, invariably, and the uh, UNEA resolution certainly speaks to financing uh, as being an element, a financing mechanism of some sort. I don't think anybody is in disagreement. But I think we also need to understand that today, the plastic that is being produced is being produced not by public money, but is being produced by private money and is creating jobs and opportunity and income and all of these things. So I don't want to vilify that sector because there are many people in the global south who work for that sector and who are making their living in that sector as well as in the global north. What we need to think about, and I live in Kenya, and the day that Kenya banned um, single-use plastic, there was a whole cottage industry of alternatives that jumped up. Right? That didn't take any financing mechanism. It took young entrepreneurs, just people on the leading, bleeding edge of business saying, okay, no longer single use, what do we do instead? And so I think um, there is a significant amount that will be just emerging because private sector is innovative and others that will have to be there on the public pocket because it's about designing new laws or creating capacities or whatever it might be, or enforcement of some sort at ports, what we're importing, what we're not importing, which will require some funding. So I think, uh, but let's not think about it as all being on the public purse, because it will not, just like plastic today is also very much on the private purse. I'll stop here. I'm sure my colleagues have other responses. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for your comments, your questions and uh, your knowledge and contribution is so important for member states. I thank you very much for the comments that you have uh, put on the table uh, this morning and also before and during this, this process. Uh, when we talk about human health, when we talk of course about the environment, that's the goal, to protect human health, to protect the environment of all MEAs. Uh, and of course it's also the goal in this, in this treaty that we are negotiating. And uh, I heard also different voices this, this afternoon about the provisions that we are negotiating, about the control measures that we are negotiating, about the means of implementation that we are negotiating in our uh, well, INC. Uh, and of course, it's quite important to have a good treaty, an effective treaty, a treaty with credible rules that will end plastic pollution. And then, also, it's quite important to have an ambitious implementation of that treaty, to implement that the treaty, this effective legally binding instrument that we will have for the end of the year, will be implementable. And for that implementation, it's also very important your contribution, because we need, yes, information, of course, data, scientific evidence, participation of all the different uh, stakeholders, but also we need from you alternatives of solutions, proposals, suggestions, 
and you have seen members are ready to receive, uh, member countries, I mean, to receive from you that, those inputs. This is a member-driven negotiation, yes, but member countries, we need also your assistance, your participation, your contribution to go ahead. As I said, together we can make it. Thank you. We will make it, absolutely. Thank you, Chair. So I'm just going to um, respond to your question on why there isn't a major group uh, system within, uh, the, within this um, INC process. So you may recall that we, uh, we adopted provisionally to apply our draft rules of procedure. These are available on our website. These, this is, these rules have established the modalities of participation for observers. Uh, and in the INC process, they do not in, indicate the establishment of major groups or constituencies modalities. However, observers may upload statements, as you know, and now we have a new system to upload them and participate in plenary on behalf of alliances, coalitions, or groups of accredited observer organizations. But this is only for the INC process, and we don't, we don't know what the rules will say once an agreement is adopted. So, um, so uh, we don't know what will happen. Keep this space, and we will see what happens then. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see a, there is a question all the way in the back. Um, if the, our staff with the microphone could go, please, to the gentleman. Yes. Hi. OK. Um, hello. So my name is Punjathan Jing Saman from Environmental Justice Foundation, Thailand. Um, I am speaking first on behalf of 102 civil society organizations from Southeast Asia and beyond working to end plastic pollution. We recently released a statement calling on the ASEAN nations to take a strong stance at INC4. We believe that Southeast Asia is an important region, one that has been disproportionately affected by plastic waste, waste trade, we have been a victim of false narrative that casts us as one of the biggest polluters, but in reality we are a place where a lot of solutions have been born, reuse, refuse solutions, and we believe that Southeast Asian voices need to be highlighted more in this uh, INC process. And speaking now as um, me, as uh, from EJF, I would like to say that there are some uh, obstacles to that. For instance, the Asia Pacific is a big region and there are many countries in there, and often not all the countries are represented there equally. Um, I also would like to say that the regional meeting currently is still not open to civil society participation observers as well. And I believe that having that participation in the regional meeting in Asia Pacific would really help to amplify the voices and the solutions from, there are many, many citizen-led solutions from our countries. Um, and also I want to highlight the importance of having a strong rule of procedures, especially not having simply a consensus uh, for decision making in INC, because that could give power to single voices that want to veto the processes. It's important to highlight the importance of voting mechanism that has worked in many other MEAs. So um, again, in solidarity for Southeast Asia, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see a hand from the la lady in the back. My name is Pangun Hakvai Wagari. I'm Native Religious Sivunga Tribal Citizen. I'm a Sivokak Yubi grandmother. I'm from uh, Sivokak, which is our traditional name for St. Lawrence Island. 
which is located in the northern Bering Sea. I'm also with Alaska Community Action on Toxics. And uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to um, share inf information about the threats to Arctic indigenous peoples because of the microplastics. We now know the Arctic Ocean has the most microplastics of all the oceans on the planet. We are finding them in our main foods, our marine mammals, including walrus, seals, and whales. We are already some of the most highly contaminated people on the planet from persistent organic pollutants. Uh, we are being contaminated without our consent through our traditional foods. Our elders call our ocean our farm. And we know that um, these microplastics are also bringing contaminants into our area and region as well, because they absorb them from the ocean. So it's so important that we make sure measures are in place to protect Arctic indigenous peoples and our children, because we know these chemicals are passed on to generations to our children. It affects our children's ability to learn. How can we pass on our songs and stories, our creations and stories, our languages, our traditions and cultures, if our children can't learn? So it's so important that, that you here to uh, work on this INC, Thank you. Um, hear from all the people that have come here to share our stories, our personal stories of the devastation that we are seeing from this climate crisis. We are um, also facing um, climate crisis from the melting of the ocean, the melting of our permafrost and glaciers, and they're ending up in our traditional foods. We're seeing species die off including fish, birds, seals, and whales, which my people have relied on for millennia. Uh, we released a report, the Arctic's plastic crisis, toxic threats to health, human rights, and indigenous lands from the petrochemical industry. We just released it earlier this year. and. Um, it's on our website, www.info at akaction.org. Together we are stronger. Thank you very much. And uh, to respond on the health aspect also, we have a um, Leslie Onion from WHO. Uh, please, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Um, I just think it's Leslie Onion speaking from the World Health Organization. I think it might be useful to give some clarification that indeed WHO sees there is no, um, that a general exemption for plastics used in healthcare would not be useful. It wouldn't be sending the right messages um, to the healthcare sector um, and particularly wouldn't necessarily pr provide the support that they need to continue innovative uh, work practices. So I uh, wanted to clarify that. Also, a couple of questions. One, um, thank you for recognizing that the treaty is not only about plastics, pollution, and environment, but plastics and human health. Um, we wanted to know if there would be, um, if you're considering a mechanism for ensuring and galvanizing health scientists and professionals to provide input into the treaty to assist in implementation. And uh, finally, um, recognizing again that these are plastics, pollution, and human health, there are certain um, technical amendments which would help to, to, to clarify this. For example, in the preamble, it might be useful to recognize the health assembly resolution, which indeed recognized the human health impacts of plastics. And I, and I wanted to ask what process there should be for providing you with those suggestions, because I know that you have a very full negotiating um, timetable this week, but is there still time to provide these technical suggestions in writing from our organization? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so I will just take, uh, there is a gentleman in the back with, um, uh, who's raised his hand. If we can uh, please give the, the floor to him as the last uh, speaker, and then we'll head to the, uh, back to the panelists for closing remarks. Hello. Thank you so much. I am Elena Estrada, Indigenous People Representative in the Major Groups UNEP. I'm chair uh, from the Caucus Indigenous in INC. So first, I want to say thank you because we think that we are are advancing in the guarantees for the, particip for the participation and for the place that we will have this time to our caucus group. But um, we think that we, we need a little more guarantees and on this way, I want to say that we don't understand in which time we change uh, from, from, because we are considered, uh, sorry, the governments and the, and the, um, INC consider us like as, Stakeholder, stakeholders, but we are not stakeholders, we are right holders, and in this way we consider that like in another platforms, we need to have the floor after the governments, just after the governments, because we are right holders, not stakeholders. And this is very important to the guaranteed to our rights. Another thing is that remember that we have all impacts in all lives cycle of the plastic from a start the industry until finalize the process and with more guarantees and have the floor in all parts, all groups, uh, contact groups and the plenary is very important to us. Um, we want to ask to finalize what uh, is uh, over, what do you do to guarantee like the people that is working uh, to lobby from the industry here don't do intervention in the decision and the, all this process. Thank you so much. And now back to our panelists for uh, final remarks and responses. Look, um, I wish we could stay much longer and had much deeper conversations. Um, and to the last lady, I mean, I would hope that we are all holding rights on this good planet. Certainly at the UN, we firmly believe in human rights and we also are very proud of the gaveling a year ago of the human right to a safe, sustainable, and uh, secure and environmentally sound environment. I mean, so enshrining therefore an environmental right as a human right, which is a very powerful thing. So yes, you're absolutely right, madam. Uh, we are all rights holders, and now it has even been upheld by the General Assembly. Um, Look, the, the, the process is still ahead of us till we hit the final gavel that the chair will bring down, uh, I hope, in, uh, in November, 2nd of December, 2nd of December <laughs> uh, in Busan in Korea, at which point we should have arrived at a final text. 
And I, I like the chair said in his introduction, we are enriched by every one of these uh, discussions. Um, and it is clear that uh, the world is demanding this. The pathway will be a little complex and there will be ups and downs, but please stay with it. And please continue to help us support the chair in finding a way that will deliver us, uh, that will uh, deliver to the world and to the next generation, to the youth who are present here and their unborn children, a treaty, a convention that will finally end plastic pollution, including in the marine environment, for once and for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, and thank you also for these new uh, comments and uh, questions. Uh, well, all the aspects that I have heard also in, in here in our meeting that you have mentioned are covered or are being negotiated and are going to be negotiated in our, in our process. But it's important your contribution again. And thank you very much also the, the question from WHO and how that contribution could be part also of the, our negotiations is quite, quite important. We are there also uh, as chair, the secretariat, also to receive your your, your inputs, uh, and uh, we will allocate, of course, a uh, time in the plenary meetings and also in the contact groups also for, for the participation and for your inputs. Together, again, it's important to work uh, together. Uh, for instance, science policy interface and what we have mentioned, we are working with us all those aspects that you have mentioned here from the different stakeholders uh, in, our, in our negotiations. It will be important once again to be working together hand by hand with you in this process with your contributions. Again, yes, a member-driven negotiation, but we need, we really need also your participation, active participation and contributions. Thank you very much. So I will start by saying a big thank you to all of you. It is important for us to hear your voices, your views. They influence us in the work that we, we do. They keep us in the straight and narrow, and it is very, very important for us to be able to have these conversations. I'm glad that we were able to have this third uh, uh, conversation with observers, and we will continue, we commit to continue to do this also through to INC5. Uh, as always, I the Secretariat and I are there, and please do get in touch with us at any time. We have, uh, I, uh, we have the Executive Director and the Chair with us, and so any uh, questions you have, any issues you have, we are here to help you solve them and to get along and do a, a great process this year with under the able leadership of the Chair for us to bang the gavel on 2nd of December, as the executive director said. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to our distinguished panelists. This brings us to the close to our, of our meeting. Uh, so let me remind all the observers that, as we did last time in INC3, we will also be coming daily to the observer room in conference room 202. A member of the INC secretariat staff will be there from 9.30 a.m. to 9.55 a.m. Uh, from the 23rd to the 28th of April to answer any questions or concerns that you may have. Uh, this brings us to the close, and we thank you once again for your time. <laughs>